Welcome to the STOA. Um, really pleased to be uh, able to offer uh, hosting another session here, um, this time with uh, Justin Fairman, who is the founder of the Flow Consciousness Institute uh, for a discussion on the art and science of flow consciousness. Um, just a few words. That's right, he is the co-founder, um, not to uh, be presumptuous here. Um, a few words about flow consciousness and why I wanted to bring Justin onto the STOA here. Uh, as you know, the STOA is a metamodernist gathering, uh, bringing all sorts of perspectives on life and consciousness together um, to integrate a uh, means of sense making in a world where that is increasingly difficult. Um, flow states and beyond that, as we'll get into flow consciousness, is an incredible way to access territory beyond the limits of the conscious mind. We're talking subconscious, unconscious, but also super conscious states. Uh, Justin, in particular, has been studying these states for over a decade, well over a decade, talking to the leading experts in the field, um, consulting with tenured professors, businesses, the entire gamut um, on how to access these states, what they are. And the reason that I think this is particularly interesting, it is both a science, it's a neuroscience, it's, it's going within the brain to understand how these states work, but it's also an art. It's also a knack of being able to align and spend increasing periods of time in these places of intense focus, but also, um, relaxed, um, broadened capacity to tune in to something far beyond the self. And in these times, the capacity to tune into that frequency uh, is the only uh, viable option that I can rationally think of that can go beyond the problems um, that we're facing today, literally from uh, a different altitude. Um, so. Justin was one of the few people that I immediately thought of who would be valuable to add to this forum with all the brain power gathered here. Uh, without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Justin to uh, talk about the art and science of flow consciousness and what he's been up to here. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Peter, and the, the intro, Duncan. And I'm excited to be here with, with all of you today and talk about flow consciousness. So. Uh, usually, I usually just go stream of consciousness, but I, I put together a presentation today. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that up and hopefully this will make it a bit easier to follow along and uh, get the most out of what I'm sharing here. So can everyone see that? You guys want to give me just a thumbs up? We good? Okay, beautiful. Yeah, so, um, you know, my intention for our time today is really to give everyone here uh, a, an overview of flow conscious, what flow consciousness is and how it's different than flow states and also synergistic with it. And then also I wanted to share a few uh, key access points for flow consciousness and get into it a little bit so that you have something to work with and to start playing with it yourselves and to spark some points of conversation um, that I think are really rich for sense making and just you know getting the most out of life so the, the the key access points that we'll talk about too just to give you guys a little preview is uh first how your mind interacts with and influences your reality um and and how you can alter your mind and reprogram it to create better outcomes and more flow and we loosely call this consciousness reality interfacing so it's the interaction between our mind our consciousness and reality and also, we'll get a bit into intuition as well, how to use it for better decision making, how it works, some of the science behind it, and how it can be leveraged to increase your flow and life, business, et cetera, relationships, and so on. Um, so with that being said, a uh, little background on flow consciousness and how it's different from flow states and uh, a little bit about what we, we do here at the Institute. And so you'll see here I, on, on the slide what I'm calling the flow continuum. And if some of you are familiar with uh, Ken Wilber's work, states versus stages, um, flow states are archetypally states, right? That's why they're called flow states. And flow consciousness on the other end of the spectrum is more akin to a stage of consciousness, a stage of psycho-spiritual development um, using that states versus stages model. And so they're both intimately related, um, but they're also distinct experiences as well. 
and, and they're highly synergistic. So, you know, on any continuum, Vesica Pisces, you've got some overlap in the middle and that's totally true with flow states and flow consciousness. So the more deeply you are in living in flow consciousness and experiencing that, the more you'll start to experience flow states and flow states also can lend themselves to experiencing more flow consciousness. And just for anybody who's new to these concepts, uh, flow states, um, these are states of peak performance, heightened awareness, expanded states of consciousness where we feel our best and perform our best. And, you know, they're, they're classically the domain and, and of you know, CEOs, extreme athletes, um, artists, writers, creatives, but anybody can experience them. It's not limited to those domains. And, you know, the, the challenge with flow states is they're inherently transitory and inherently temporary, like any state, sleeping, waking, dreaming, et cetera. They come and go and they're valuable when they're around, but when they're when they're not happening, we might shift to a lower level of functioning. Flow consciousness, on the other hand, because it's a stage of development, a psycho-spiritual stage of development, once you get to a certain level, it's more or less permanent. And it will actually support you experiencing more flow states or more frequent flow states when you're in higher and higher levels of flow consciousness. Flow consciousness compared to flow states, which is more about you know, peak performance on some level, uh, peak states of consciousness, flow consciousness is more akin to a philosophy or a way of life. Um, you know, you, you could draw parallels between Zen philosophy or Taoist philosophy and flow consciousness. And there's definitely a lot of overlap with those, you know, spiritual philosophies and spiritual traditions there. But there's also a very modern piece of it that's based on cutting edge findings from different fields like neurobiology, neuroscience, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a little bit about flow states and flow consciousness, and, and they both feed into each other, like I said, but we'll be primar primarily focusing on um, flow consciousness today. And so what exactly is flow consciousness in a nutshell? I, I just described it in very like archetypal terms, but how we like to describe it is a, a new operating system for your mind that allows you to access peak levels of consciousness, performance, success, and so on. Or another way to think about it is an accelerated path to unlocking your full potential. Um, and, and the foundation of operating in flow consciousness is really a rewiring of one's perception and an internal operating system such that they're locked into ways of seeing the world and acting that engender flow and, and particularly non-dual states of consciousness. The more deeply you go into flow, the, the higher you climb on the stage development ladder, the more often you end up in these non-dual expanded states of awareness that are really conducive to living in flow. Uh, and our, our background at the Institute is really doing research into the nature of reality, consciousness, uh, peak performance, human potential, neurobiology, positive psychology, spirituality, and so on. We really, we're really holistic and we do a big survey and try and find the points of overlap between all these fields that are pointing to some larger truth that we can then use to develop tools and trainings for living the most fulfilling and successful life possible, however, however you define that. Because ultimately, if we can't grow corn <laughs> Or, or non, you know, gluten-free bread or whatever it is, then, uh, then what, what use is all this theory, right? If it doesn't actually improve our lives, so we really try to make everything as practical as possible. And on that note, these are some of the benefits that people regularly experience when they're living in flow consciousness at, at high levels. There's a few slides here, so I'll just kind of run through these. And you know, this this presentation I think is being recorded, and so you can you guys can reference these again if you want to. But one of them is increased happiness and life fulfillment. Um, decreased stress, self-doubt, and insecurity. Uh, we'll talk about some studies later that show people that are consistently doing some of the things we're talking about today and, and applying some of the core aspects of flow consciousness, experience 50% increase in likelihood of successful outcomes in life and business, which is really awesome. Um, so there's definitely a, a strong focus on, on healing and resolving trauma in, in flow consciousness. Is that something that tends to hold us back in our stage development? So healing and releasing of fears, trauma, anxiety, limiting beliefs, and so on. Um, you know, bridging with flow states a bit, there's definitely a, an increase in performance, productivity, creativity, and so on. It's easier to expand, access expanded states of consciousness and flow. Um, people report greater overall quality of life, greater self-confidence and resilience. And of course, increased, increased intuition, that's, a, that's a, definitely one of the major access points of flow, which we'll talk about today. And so that also can lead to emotional intelligence um, and lasting deep sense of inner peace and calmness, uh, definitely a heavy focus on, on purpose and meaning and impact and improved relationships and social coherence. So this is just a little taste just to give you an idea of 
the benefits of, of, of living in flow consciousness and applying some of the tools and practices that help you get there. So getting into uh, the nuts and bolts of it a little bit more, um, there's really nine key aspects that we've identified that need to be mastered or developed to like a, a high level of skill to really be able to access the highest levels of flow consciousness. And that's way more than we have time to go into today. I think my, my timeline for this presentation is like 20 or 30 minutes. So we're going to talk about two of those and get go as far as we can. Um, but before we get into that, there's two key aspects of living in flow consciousness that are really important to understand. This is inner flow and an outer flow. And inner flow is essentially the domain of everything going on inside your what you would consider your consciousness or your mind or your, your personal experience. So your thoughts, your emotions, your perceptions, everything going on and what we perceive is, is our body and the limits of our body. That's, that's the domain of inner flow. And outer flow, on the other hand, is how we track flow or flow consciousness out in our environment. And so everything outside of ourselves. And there's obviously a dynamic interplay between these, these two aspects, but outer flow really is focused on uh, decision-making, like how do we navigate the challenges and experiences we have in life through our inner uh, experience and also by making decisions and taking different actions out, out in the world. And so to, to dive into how uh, that operates. We're going to talk a little bit about inner flow here. And so I mentioned before at the beginning, what we call consciousness reality interfacing. And this is one of the primary domains of inner flow. And this really has to do with how what's going on internally impacts what's happening externally for us. And in addition to our mental and emotional state of being. And so the, the idea and what we find, and it seems to be a, a, a you know, that, that a lot of the research that we study is pointing to is that there is a very profound influence between what's going on in our mind and what's happening externally. And to some of you, this may be obvious, but there's a lot of different schools of thought in academia and scientific communities that believe there's almost no influence outside of just basic decision making. But actually, there's a really huge degree of influence such that we often say that it, it, it that there's such a strong influence of your consciousness on reality that it is actually the most important thing. It is the elephant in the room because literally as, as I'll show in the next few slides here that everything that we experience cannot be separated from our consciousness. And so what's going on in here has a huge impact on what's happening externally. And if we make specific shifts internally, then we can have really profound results externally. And so the first level of consciousness reality in, interfacing is what we call internal reality. And there's a famous saying that we don't see reality as it is, we see reality as we are. And this is alluding to the fact that we cannot separate our experience of reality from our beliefs about it. Some of you may know this as confirmation bias and there's other you know, uh, st studies of different mental biases that um, you know, talk about this. But essentially the, the easiest way to describe it is that two people can be having the same exact experience by any observer's effect, right? There could be two people standing right next to each other in a room having the exact same experience by, by all intents and purposes, but internally they're having radically different experiences so they're experiencing radically divergent realities even though they're having the same external experience and so a way to kind of conceptualize this is let's say that when you were uh you know in high school or something and you went to a dance and if you're a woman maybe you're the the, the man that you were dating or whoever you were dating had some kind of red clothing on and you had your first kiss and it was a really positive experience right and we get this pavlovian conditioning with the color red that makes that, you know, uh, in, in, engender positive emotional states from us and positive perceptions. On the other hand, if you were a little kid and you got hit by a car uh, or you fell off a red bike and hurt yourself, um, you might have negative associations with the color red. So if somebody were to come into that room wearing the color red, or if there was some color red in there, each person would be calling, recalling different experiences that would have different associations. And one person might be in joy and experiencing, you know, increased oxytocin and serotonin and really happy. And the other person might actually be in a trauma response. And so this is happening every single second of every single day, no matter what you're doing, whether you're sleeping or you're awake, it's happening 24 seven. So even though we're all having the same experience externally or what seems like the same experience externally, we're actually internally all having radically different experiences. And so each individual reality and this, you know, harkens back to sense making is completely different, you know, and this is really important for flow because 
if you have certain beliefs, certain perceptions, certain trauma imprints, that's going to affect your decision making, which we'll talk about in the in the, the next piece of, of this puzzle here. And it actually has really profound impacts on your life. So this brings us to level two. Let's see if I can get the slide to go here. There we go. There we go. Level two. Okay. So level two is how our consciousness interacts with reality externally. So we just described a lot of things that were going on under the hood. How does that actually produce tangible shifts in our reality? Well, to describe how this works, we, we've come up with what's called the Betar model. And the Betar model is a map of the psychological phenomenon that happen every moment of every day that actually have a huge influence on, on our reality and how much joy and fulfillment and success and purpose and so on that we can experience. And so it, it's a map of what happens starting with beliefs and moving through to fully external results reality here um, and what happens in that sequence. So I'll just start at the tops here, top here. So we've got beliefs and our beliefs are the most fundamental layer of our, of our consciousness and our programming. They allow us to simplify the huge amount of complexity that we deal with every moment into meaningful ways that allows us to make rational decisions such that we can be surviving and ultimately thriving in our reality. So beliefs are the most foundational level of our consciousness that we've been able to identify. And they're essentially meta perceptions that help us make sense of what's happening. And based on what you believe, like we talked about in level one, that's gonna influence uh, how you feel. If you know red is associated with danger to you, then it's gonna put you into an emotional state, potentially of fear or anxiety. And if red is associated with you know uh, something positive, then you're going to likely be happy and in, and in an elated state. And our beliefs and our emotions together produce our thoughts. If you've ever wondered where thoughts come from, they're not random. They are the output of the incredible algorithm of thousands of beliefs and, and micro emotions interacting simultaneously. And those cohere into our conscious mind, which we'll talk about a little bit later, into a, a given thought or thoughts. And then based on what we're feeling and what we're thinking about something that leads to the decision we make. And then the decision we make informs the action that we take. And then it's the actions that we consistently take, which ultimately create the results or the reality that we're experiencing. And you know, this seems very simple and linear on one level, but if you really dive into it, it can get pretty multidimensional how this plays out. Because essentially your reality right now is the experience that you're having wherever you are, plus whatever is extended to you through technology and messaging and you know, media and so on. But essentially your reality is where you are right now and where you are right now is the result of the cumulative decisions and actions that you've made over the course of your entire life. And those have all, all been entirely based on your belief and emotional conditioning and therefore your reality right now is the result of your beliefs and your emotions playing out this sequence over time in tens of thousands of micro decisions and macro decisions every day. So basically what we, what we can glean from this is if you make shifts at the base of this pyramid or this stack here at the belief level that is going to echo out through all these different things, all these different parts of our, of our psychological stack here, and it's going to result in a different reality on the other end. So certain beliefs that you hold are going to create, produce certain outcomes. And if you change those beliefs, then it changes this whole sequence and you start to get different outcomes. So an example we, we often give is, you know, if you believe the world's a dangerous place, that's going to influence this stack such that you're much less likely to go out into the world and have, uh, you know, varied experiences and to be multicultural and so on and so forth. Because if you're experiencing a lot of fear about how the world is, you, the, the way that the psyche operates doesn't tend to do things that put its survival in jeopardy. And so you won't typically take actions and make decisions and such that, that will shoot you in that direction. On the other side of the coin, if you believe the world's a generally safe and friendly place, you're much more likely to be friendly and gregarious and out in the world and social and being like that. You know, there's been studies, psychological studies done on like people that are more social tend to have more happiness, tend to have richer community networks, tend to have more success and so on. And so you, you basically get this butterfly effect, effect or cause and effect chain that produces significantly different realities based on what your beliefs are. And so at the Institute, we're really focused on identifying what are the most important beliefs for someone to hold such that they have the most, the maximum possible happiness, joy, connection, success, impact, and so on in their life, in their business, in families. And we study it in different domains because sometimes there's different beliefs that are needed for, for each one. And also at the same time on the, on, on the flip side of that coin, what are the beliefs that create suffering and struggle and pain and lead to war and all these different things and, and create 
cultural issues and so on and so forth. And so, you know, this is kind of like our epistemic foundation is, is dealing with beliefs and then resolving and working with trauma as well, which is more on the level of emotions, because these two things have a huge impact because of the, the results of this sequence. So that's uh, external reality. And then there's one more level too, uh, which as well, let's see, slides go here. Um, okay. And the level, the third level is uh, what we would call quantum reality. And this is a little bit controversial, but you know, we're, we're pretty deep into the science on this. And we, like, you know, Duncan said, we're working with a lot of researchers, quantum physics researchers, theoretical physics researchers, people from, you know, biology, neurobiology, and so on. Uh, we have a, a few of them on our board even. And we're, there is a, a huge amount of research showing that the Copenhagen interpretation of, of quantum physics is actually true. And not, not just, you know, uh, exp, um, like uh, uh, lab-based research, but, but real world studies that, you know, are, are measuring the impact that consciousness has on subatomic quantum processes. And so, you know, this is essentially the domain of mind matter interactions and what we would call entangled brains. And the, this level is important to acknowledge because even when we're not out in the world necessarily doing something, or if we're, if we're not an activist, we're not, we don't feel like we're very active in the world, just our, our default emotional state of being and our perception actually has echo effects out through the entangled nature of consciousness. And just you know, there's been there's been different researchers that have studied mind matter interactions and shown that physical matter is affected by our perception of it, our consciousness, our level of intention. Let alone um, uh, other human beings. There's actually a much stronger effect in other human beings. Our you know brain waves tend to synchronize in groups. Um, you know uh, what's it called? Heart rate variability tends to synchronize when we're in groups. So even if we're not talking to each other, just being in the same room with people, there often will become a sync in different biometric measures that researchers have observed time and time and time again. Um, you know, you could think of it similar to like when birds are in a flock and they're all flying and moving in, in the exact same moment. That, that nature has a bias that tends to happen when we're in groups. So one person's emotional state, even if they're not actually physically interacting or even talking to somebody else, can actually bleed over through different quantum properties, through different, different um, uh, you know, aspects of our biology and influence other people's state and consciousness. So this is actually a really important area to acknowledge because you know, it, it, it's actually quite empowering from our view that just by focusing on yourself and your own personal development and healing, you can actually have really profound effects uh, on your local community and even um, uh, global consciousness, which is, which is really beautiful. So to kind of sum up this aspect of inner flow here, let's see, there we go. Um, key takeaways are that foundational shifts in our beliefs and perceptions and emotional state echo out through cause and effect chains of the Bethdar sequence and quantum effects to cause corresponding changes in an individual's consciousness and life experience. And, and to, to make it really practical, positive beliefs almost always result in positive flow enhancing outcomes and negative slash limiting beliefs uh, almost always result in flow decreasing outcomes. And so, you know, to access flow consciousness, it's really important to start to do a survey and to dig beneath the surface of the conscious mind and, and try to understand what these root levels of our programming are so we can identify if we have something that's not actually serving what we're trying to experience or create or what we desire. And, and both individually, collectively, culturally, and so on. And, and once we identify those, use different processes to shift them into more positive flow enhancing beliefs. And there's different ways to do that. Uh, there's a lot of different modalities to do that and so on and so forth, but it's, it's too much to get into here. Um, so that's a, an overview of inner flow. And we will now jump over to outer flow and talk about another one of the key pieces, which is intuition. And intuition is another key access point for flow. So doing this deep inner rewiring work is one key access point for flow out of the nine. And really learning how to dial up and access and use your intuition to, the, to its fullest capacity is another really important key access point for flow. And the reason that is, is because of the huge difference in processing power between our intuition and our conscious mind. And to highlight how that works, um, I'd like to share what I call the chessboard analogy. And the chessboard analogy is a really beautiful way to describe this. And if you imagine that a human player is playing a game of chess against a chess supercomputer, how many moves in advance 
do you think the human player can see before there's too many possible combinations and their, their mind gets overwhelmed? You can throw some fingers up or throw it in the chat box. Some of you maybe actually know the answer to this question. So I'm seeing three from some people. So, you know, there's, there's literally, I think, 64 billion different possible combinations of moves that can be made in any given chess game. Um, so human players can usually only see, like chess grandmasters supposedly could see like six to 10 moves in advance, but most people can only see a couple moves in advance, maybe two or three at most, before there's too many different combinations of moves to know what the, the next best move is. But if you take a supercomputer on the other hand, in literally a microsecond, it can calculate every possible combination of moves that can be made. And it knows exactly what's the, the, the highest probable outcome of success based on whatever the human player is doing. And the, the human player in this analogy is a metaphor for your conscious mind. It can only see a couple moves in advance before there's so many different probabilities of how things turn out that there's no way it could possibly know what, what is coming next. But your intuition on the other hand is like the supercomputer. It actually is able to process a, a, a huge amount of data. Um, so researchers studying intuition versus rational analysis, intuition, our intuition subconscious can process about 65 billion bits of data per second, whereas our rational conscious mind can process about 10,000 bits of data per second. That's a 6.5, uh, this is a typo, it's a 6.5 million X increase in the power of our intuition over our conscious mind. So our intuition is literally like a probability analyzing supercomputer that's taking in as much data as possible to try and sort for the outcomes that increase our survival. And then to the degree that that's fulfilled, in increase our success and our fulfillment and our happiness and our safety and our health. Like this is a fundamental biological property that, that all sentient organisms have is they're sorting for their own highest good. And so our intuition is, is a much better tool for doing that than rational analysis alone. Ideally, you use both, and I'll talk about how, how you go to, to go about that in a minute, but you really want to be using your intuition as much as possible because it just completely uh, you know, blows your rational conscious mind out of the water. Your, your rational conscious mind can't even understand the data that's being fed to it by intuition. It doesn't, it, it's not even possible to understand 65 billion bits of data with a part of you that can only process 10,000 bits of data per second. And this, is a, this trips a lot of people up because because the, their conscious mind doesn't understand the signals that are coming from their intuition, we tend to discount it and we tend to write it off and not acknowledge it. But actually it should really be the opposite way is that we don't take our conscious mind seriously unless we have a match between our, in, our intuitive data and, and our conscious data. That's when we get 65 billion plus you know, 10,000 and that's the maximum processing power we have. So we're the high, we have the highest likelihood of making good decisions when, when we're doing that. And so, let's see, there we go. So, you know, there's a lot of people that have been studying intuition. Um, there's a few studies here that, you know, uh, of different organizations and institutions that have been studying intuition. There's quite a bit more. We have a huge archive of this, but, you know, it's all I could fit on the slide and some of my, my favorites. This one in particular, Dean, Mihala Dean and Mihalaski, they did a study of executives, 5,000 executives and they gave them tests measuring their ESP and their intuition. And then they correlated that with their success in business or lack thereof. And what they found is that the CEOs who tested to have the lowest levels of intuitional capacity had results consistent with random chance. And the CEOs who had the highest intuitional capacity um, in, on average increased their, their profitability of their business by 50% or more um, over the course of five years. And so, you know, this is one of the pioneering studies. Uh, Harvard Business School did a study, 1,300 global executives, and 900 of them said that their, um, their success in business and in their companies or as founders was almost entirely the result of them using intuition consistently, especially for really complex decision-making like these kind of people face. So all of these studies basically show that there's an increased likelihood of successful outcomes in multiple domains from the battlefield to business to interpersonal relationships and so on um, in investing and trading medicine. I mean, the, the, the data is pouring in that basically any field you can use intuition in in any area of life, it produces better outcomes when it's being used accurately. I'll just add that <laughs> when it's being used accurately and when it's properly studied, because a lot of the control measures that they take to study intuition um, in a lot of researches are actually really bad ways to do it. So it's important to distinguish that. And so to, to sum up, intuition here, um, key the key takeaways is basically in our perspective, there's an implicate order 
beyond the rationalizations of the logical mind that drives harmony at cosmological scales and that expresses itself through us all, through us and all organisms via the faculty of our intuitive felt sense. Um, and this is often talked about in a lot of spiritual philosophies, the Tao, Wu Wei, what we would call flow consciousness in modern terms. And this is, you know, the fact that every decision you make, even the smallest, seemingly most insignificant ones are actually ultra complex. When you break, when you really break down things, how things in the brain, brain work to assess probabilities. And because of its superior data collection abilities, intuition is virtually always the best method of making or verifying choices. And it delivers that data to you primarily by a sensation and feeling, since this is proto and meta to language. Because we, we humans tend to think that, you know, um, like we, we forget that we have language and that most other species don't have a coherent language or schooling like we do. And yet they're able to assemble into these really beautiful ecosystem flows and natural relationships that produce this pretty incredible level of harmony when humans aren't meddling with it. And the only way that that could really take effect is if there is some meta language, some, something that all biological organisms have access to that allows them to, to make decisions in ultra complex environments. And so in our view, that's our feeling and our sensation. And you know, this is present in a lot of the intuition research. And we found that by training people how to become really present to how their intuition shows up and, and primarily paying attention to how they're feeling and sensations and interpreting that with the proper lens, they get really great outcomes over time. And so Intuition, essentially, the access point is our felt sense and our, and our sensations. And, and by developing that part of our experience through inner healing work and skill building and so on, we can actually develop really powerful intuitional capacities that allow us to survive and thrive uh, on the long term, not just the short term. So that's all I got for everyone today on uh, flow consciousness. I hope that was really helpful and give you guys some insight into some access points and how it works and get, get into the science a bit. And um, we've got more uh, trainings, research, et cetera, articles, videos, all the good stuff on our website, which is right here. So I'll just leave this slide up and uh, happy to, to chat, take questions, discuss everything um, with all of you. Wonderful. So uh, thank you very much, Justin, for the presentation. And now we're shifting to the Q&A segment. Um, so anybody who has a question, just type that up in the chat window. I'm going to ask a couple of questions while you um, get your brains to working on what you want to ask Justin, uh, but I definitely have a few for you right here and now. Um, you know, a lot of my exposure to the concept of flow or, or this kind of life force energy, source energy, has come from the lens of spirituality. And, um, you know, a lot of Buddhist conditioning is about letting go of your samskaras, processing them, releasing craving and aversion so that you have a clear uh, mind and a broader perspective and affiliation. And then you have Patanjali and the, the yamas and niyamas um, to assist in your input and output stream, garbage in, garbage out, or clarity in, clarity out. Um, and uh, especially, I think, interesting to flow is um, uh, dharana, right? Like the, the capacity to focus entirely on the object of your perception such that you merge with it. So that there's, there's a limit in the perceiver, perceived, and perception. It, it kind of collapses back inwards. And then that, that maybe builds like this connection with energy. So it's like, from you, I hear on the one hand, there is a, a focus on reducing those traumas, like getting that trauma conditioning out of the way, so that you're not horse blinded into a reality that's not uh, a reflection of what actually is. And then there's this fascinating part of like, what are the muscles that actually build your focus build your ability to tap into uh, these states and make sure that that additional energy isn't just used to build a new ego consciousness that then leads to the same traps and the same car wrecks that happened from a traumatized state. So like getting out of that kind of looping state. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious, and I know that we didn't have the time to get into specific practices on, um, on building flow, building that energy and avoiding the pitfalls of an enhanced energetic system. But these are the practical uh, points that I'm really interested for in my life. And I don't know if you could briefly touch on that. 
the analogy with different spiritual processes and, and the most practical ways of, you know, going beyond the trauma conditioning to some of these superhuman capacities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a really beautiful summation of, of a lot of the concepts and referencing some other, you know, philosophical markers. And, you know, the, I, I would like to invoke, you know, Kantian philosophy here, right? At the end of the day, we, we cannot separate our experience of reality from our consciousness. Even, even if there may be an objective reality, like we still experience it through our lenses and our perceptions and our internal experience 24 seven. And so, you know, to, to really get in our, in our opinion, to really get into the most expanded states of being or consciousness and to sustain that it's critical to optimize our internal experience for those exact things. And I think a lot of these practices that you mentioned, these different, these different traditions have spent a lot of time, thousands of years, in many cases, developing practices to refine these, this internal experience such that it engenders, you know, all of these things that we all kind of want. And the, the, the positive psych research is showing that are like the, the hallmarks of happiness and health. And so, you know, we, we have different tools that we use. There's many, many different modalities. You know, some people are familiar with EMDR, other people are, you know, familiar with somatic experiencing and so on. There's literally hundreds, if not thousands of different modalities for modern modalities for shifting these different internal states. We have certain ones that we work with at the Institute that we really like. We're, we're particularly interested in what's the fastest and most efficient path, because in our experience, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of perceptions and traumas that are operating from the micro to macro level. And so there's a lot to clean up internally. And that's probably why enlightenment is conceived of as so hard it, because it just there's just so much to correct um, internally to get us to that place where we're in like a permanent non-dual state of consciousness and so on and so forth. Um, and so, so we're interested in efficiency and what's, what's most effective and allows us to like work quickly. But, you know, primarily you, you can use the tools from these different religions, from these different spiritual traditions, and they work really well. And then there's more modern tools that we think build on top of that and some of the learnings from that, right? Like human, humanity is like kind of growing its body of knowledge and evolving. And so I think some of the modern tools are even more rapid than some of these, these older tools, but they, they play really nicely together. So there's this deep psychological piece to what you said. And then there's like training the focus of the mind and like things like meditation and mindfulness are, we haven't found anything better than that necessarily to like train the mind and train the focus. Mindfulness is one of the things that we teach as a way to start training your decision-making over to more intuitive based decision-making or training your awareness to, to form around some of these different uh, you know, like non-dual beliefs and flow enhancing beliefs and so on. So there's this, there's this interplay between the internal and the external. The internal is always going to be like psychological, psycho-spiritual in nature, and the external is going to be more action-based and mindfulness-based to correct anything, you know, based on what's happening to us externally. So I, I, I think that kind of answers your question to prompt a little bit. Helps. Sure. I'm going to bump this over to Avi uh, for a question right here. Avi, would you... Um... Would you be able to ask yours here? Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, thanks for this beautiful presentation. Uh, I loved it. Thank uh, you. Bobby. Yeah, it did explain the value we can get from heightened consciousness, but I was more of um, curious to understand, uh, you know, few of the approaches which you have identified are useful in taking us toward those states uh, as you said you have effective uh, you had identified some efficient ways to do so uh, yeah definitely we do know about few processes which religions give us or meditation practices give us what are the other practical means which you have identified which can fast track this process uh, without jeopardizing the harmful effects of uh, not uh, getting into the side effects of heightened states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good question. I mean, this is you know, this is really like the meat of what we do in our core training. So it's a lot to kind of bring bring it all into a short amount of time. But you know, one of the ways, for example, that I harped on in the presentation was you know intuition. That this actually, in our in our belief, intuition is optimizing for our full our our highest good, our our full potential, our full manifestation of purpose, and 
and all that we can be. And so by consistently applying intuition, there's this side effect from it or direct effect, depending on how you look at it, that leads us towards experiences that ultimately engender us being anchored into higher states of consciousness. And that often happens because, you know, the on some level, like the psyche knows that certain traumas and limiting perceptions are hurting it just as much as they're protecting it. And so a lot of times intuition will lead us to experiences that bring those things to the surface such that they they can be resolved. Because you know, there's a net negative effect on the body from trauma, right? Like, you know, psychoneuroimmunology neuro research has shown that like, you know, if we're constantly in stress and fear, it actually chips away at our physical health. So the body knows on some level that it that this is a, a net negative, even though it's kind of a protective mechanism on another level. And so a lot of times intuition will lead us to have experiences or lead us in such a way that it becomes appealing to us to resolve these um these traumas and these psychological things that are they're impeding us. So there's a kind of nice interplay with with the internal flow level, but even externally, you know, it, our intuition is guiding us towards the experiences that um, are are ultimately for our highest good, and, and we believe that that would be being in a, you know a non dual state of consciousness or a higher state of consciousness, deep in compassion and so on and so forth. So so that's one of the ways. Um, there's there's literally perceptions that we can take on, for example, from Buddhist traditions. Um, you know, like the principle of acceptance, right? Or non-resistance or non-attachment, like by using mindfulness to really anchor ourselves in that perception, um, it tends to reduce suffering significantly and pop us into flow states. Like that per, for me is one of the most profound and fastest ways to access a flow state without meditation or even meeting a lot of the other conditions is just radically presencing oneself to the correlate of that of that of non-attachment, which is the, the perfection of every moment, by being in that space and really acknowledging that and, and kind of contemplating it, you can pop yourself into a flow state pretty quickly. And then of course, doing healing work like we talked about, doing the, the belief rewiring work, doing the emotional trauma healing work, and so on and so forth. And there's there's a lot of other tools that we use as well from the innovation space to help get people out of linear thinking and into much more complex, multidimensional, non-linear thinking that allows us to rise above the perceived problems and limits in our environment such that we can actually be in an expanded state of consciousness or awareness. And, and then from there, that allows us to actually see opportunities that other people don't necessarily. And that provides all kinds of benefits like professionally and also personally and so on. So th there's a lot, and I don't want to just kind of like rattle off things to diminish them here, but but hopefully that gives a taste of, of some of the things you can do. Yeah, uh, sounds good. If, if I may, I have just a you know, follow-up question on that one. Uh, what, what I'm getting from uh, this one is the intuition is a key one, right? Intuition, if you trust your intuition, uh, that's going to help you a lot. Uh, my concern with that one is, uh, Many a times uh, you have, you get intuition, oh, this is going to happen this way. This is probably going to happen. And you get that intuition and you choose to do it and you choose not to do it many times. And then you say, oh, tap on your head. Oh, why didn't I do it when I didn't do it? Right. It could be example with one of, just to give you a very silly example, somebody thinking, oh, I should buy a lottery ticket today because I feel that I might get a lottery ticket. If he gets it, He'll say, all right, I worked on my intuition. But he'll say, if he didn't win it, he'll say, oh, I wasted my money again. So how do you, how do you appreciate uh, the intuition and how do you uh, give that uh, course correction with the intuition, which, because many times intuition might not lead you to a proper things. Many times they would be just a, uh, uh, your external factors or internal emotions, they might be affecting you or uh, you know directing you toward uh, sudden uh, things rather than a correct intuition. How do you actually differentiate between those two? Right, and, and this uh, dovetails with Stephen Henry's question, how do you discern between intuition and impulse? Uh, if you could thread that in there as well, I think well, that would be a benefit. Yeah, okay. I think that's yeah. I'll see if I can answer four questions in one one answer. <laughs> um, okay, so so 
couple of things. I'll, I'll just talk about the dynamics of intuition that are kind of bigger than most people acknowledge. Um, cause we tend to like use our conscious minds to analyze everything and it only handles 10,000 bits per data, but intuition is a very multidimensional complex thing and how it plays out. So when you widen your lens on it, then all of a sudden things that seem kind of paradoxical or, or counterintuitive, funnily enough, or, or even conflicting, you know, actually suddenly makes sense. So first of all, there's different types of intuition, and this is not really properly delineated in a lot of research. So you have associative intuition and what I call non-associative intuition. Associative intuition is essentially the, the subconscious mind guessing at what's likely true based on pre-existing domain expertise or whatever available data is at hand. This is like Freudian kind of reductionist view of intuition. This is really common. This is most people's working definition of intuition. It's if you, if you Google what the definition of intuition, this is the definition you get. It's associative intuition. It's the subconscious mind trying to assess probabilities. That's valuable in a lot of cases, but it's not the only type of intuition. There's also non-associative intuition. And that is intuition where quantum aspects of our consciousness are able to reach out across space and time through the phenomenon of entanglement in order to pull data that's not necessarily local to our mind. And in doing that, the, the precision of intuition often goes up substantially because it's not just educated guessing, it's actually using a faculty that we possess to get accurate data that exists, that's holographically encoded across all of reality and, and, and on a quantum level. And so, so it's important to, to differentiate between those two because sometimes when people are thinking they're using intuition, it's really just impulse, which is basically like a deep psychological drive, a deep unconscious psychological drive that kind of bleeds over a little bit into associative intuition. And so a lot of times the, the reason people like misperceive the accuracy of intuition or if it's good or bad or has good or bad outcomes is because the difference between those two, it's, and, and I can say more about that if, if we all want to go there. Um, on another level too, another quality of intuition that's important to understand is that intuition is optimizing for long-term success and thriving. Like this is obvious, it's like an inherent property of reality. Like, and so it's not, so sometimes what's, what would seem like a success or like a correct thing, answer, decision on the short term would actually set you up for negative probabilities long-term. And so a lot of the intuition research and a lot of ways we conceptualize intuition deal with this really short-term thing. Like, you know, if you use the lottery example, it's like, well, I got, I got this one wrong, right? And so th my intuition failed or I got it right. And so my intuition was successful. But another way to think about it is like, what if you got this lottery ticket wrong? And in doing so, that caused you to, for example, not feel good about yourself, which then you heard this presentation and you did some inner work and all of a sudden you had a, a better positive belief that actually increased the possibilities for you and increased your intuitional capacity. And then the next time you actually got the lottery right, right? And so this is just an example, but you can play out like infinite probabilities of cause and effect chains based on how our intuition is orienting us in space and time and how all of our decisions are orienting in space and time. This is like the domain of, of the better model. So a lot of times, like when we're assessing intuition, we're not looking at it through a long enough time scale or, or a large enough lens to really like understand the ways that it might be positioning us across space and time. We were in a workshop once and we had a woman uh, we were we were talking about this this exact thing and she raised her hand and she said you know she told us this story well one time she was at, at the airport in new york and she was about to get on a on a flight um or she i don't know if she was in new york she was somewhere and she was about to get on a flight and she got this sinking feeling in her in her stomach and she said that she all of a sudden really didn't want to get on the flight and she couldn't understand why and she had paid 800 dollars for the ticket and it was completely irrational you know, from the data that she had to not get on this flight. It was just a normal day and this was a normal flight. And so why was she getting this crazy sinking feeling in her stomach? Thankfully, she listened to her intuition, didn't get on the flight. And that was one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. And so this is the, this is like, it perfectly encapsulates the nature of intuition where it's, it's often non-linear and it's directing us around obstacles we can't even see. Um, because there's pre it has precognitive abilities. The research of Julia Mossbridge and a lot of people at IONS dive into this and HeartMath as well. HeartMath Institute gets into this a bit as well. And so like when we're, when we're optimizing for intuition, there's this deeper layer of trust that's needed in the process that it takes you on, which is very nonlinear and maybe very different from what you might've consciously expected or, or planned for yourself. So 
yeah, I, 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 there's a lot of questions in there and hopefully that kind of paints the dynamics of some of the, the different ways that it works and why we have to be really careful about how we like assess what accurate is with intuition and, and might increase our lens for different studies and stuff like that. I, um, I have one quick question, which I think may be of relevance to, to people here um, based on addiction and flow. Um, and I'm, I'm just like curious about the attention capture mechanisms of social media, for example, to, to get you on autoplay and these, these routes that are shaped for your consciousness that were developed based on um, Las Vegas slot machines and those kind of algorithms versus self-directed flow. Um, even when I go into flow states uh, with performance, it can feel somewhat addictive to use those loops rather than access other parts of my brain. So like what, what role does addiction play in flow and flow consciousness? And, and to what extent um, do you have to guard against creating these kind of limited loops rather than accessing a broader horizon? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's definitely a lot of like, you know, mechanisms in our current society that are trying to pull us into agendas that maybe are not for our highest good. But at the same time, we also have that kind of same in, internal issue as well. And not so much with like addiction per se, but just that what got you so far may not get you further, right? And so there's this process where we kind of have to constantly be in some level of like meta self-reflection to be able to catch ourselves to and not get sucked into addictive loops because those can sabotage flow for sure. Um, one of the one of the principles uh, that we teach is, um, you know, seeking balance through polarity of activities. And so, for example, if you're always, if every day you get up and you spend most of the day in your house doing work, and you go to the same coffee shop, and you go to the same, and you go on Facebook at the coffee shop or whatever, and you come back to your house, and that's your routine every single day, like you're missing out on so many, you, you basically have reality confirmation bias at that point. Your reality is so limited to that specific experience that it actually, in our experience, will sabotage your long-term happiness and success. And so by intentionally doing activities that are uh, like opposite uh, or, or you know, polarity of what you're normally doing, you actually like, first of all, increase neuroplasticity. It's really good for your brain health to have novel new experiences. It can be a great way to wire in new beliefs, but it also gives you really great perspective, almost, you know, like mindfulness on your own life, right? It gives you this perspective where you're in a different routine and you suddenly can see all the different ways that being addicted to or in this habitual pattern may actually be limiting you from things that you want or might make your life better. And so it's the, so it's the same essential principle with social media, you know, that, that might be gamified and trying to hook you into, you know, dopamine loops and so on and so forth. But it's essentially the same thing. Like you, you want to continually expand your experience in such a way that you're balancing out your normal everyday experience. And so if you're doing that consistently, then you can kind of save yourself from um, like getting into a Facebook hole. You know, if you put down, if you have an intention or a first principle that you live by where you, if, if you rec recognize that you're on your phone all day, or very often that you take, you take time without your phone in a different environment, you will have a ton of insight about that pattern and will be much easier to break it and not get caught up in the negative aspects of it. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I saw some interest in Rebecca's question as well. Um, I'd like to bounce to her. Uh, sure, uh, my first question. Um, it's my, uh, I'll go with that. My first question was, um, how do you conceptualize the place of just plain luck uh, in all this, if it's included within the philosophical model? Um, and then to elaborate on that, um, if uh, you're looking at someone's overall success and well being as a function of their ability to achieve inner and outer flow, to what extent does luck influence the factors that allow one to achieve those states? Um, and also, to what extent does luck influence the nature of someone's kind of like non dualistic interface with the external world? Yeah, great, great question. This is this is a fun one for me. Um, so, well, first of all, like, what what is the epistemic foundation of luck? Like, it's a concept essentially that we all have culturally agreed upon exists, but it's based in a specific worldview and philosophy that assumes that there is 
essentially random things that happen in the universe that are completely outside of like our conscious control or influence. So that's like one philo so like so like luck is based in a very it's a it's a very specific definition and concept based in a certain worldview and there could be varying worldviews that it stems from but essentially it's saying like in my experience luck is like this thing that can happen and it's not related to you in any way um, and and so from the other perspective that that we tend to hold at the institute is chaos is uh, unfathomably intricate order. In our experience, like all of reality is based on sophisticated cause and effect chains. This is mirrored in quantum physics and the kind of like pilot wave theory. And so like everything in our reality, as far as we can tell is based on certain laws. Like, you know, we our, our whole modern technology is built on laws of physics and so on and so forth. And so it's, it, to me, it's funny that there would be something different in consciousness or in, in our, in our, you know, in, in how reality operates and how we move through the world. Because essentially, as far as we can tell, everything is based on law. So in our view, essentially, luck is a is the outpouring of cause and effect chains that all ultimately come back to beliefs and consciousness. And there is this really dynamic interplay between our individual consciousness and like the collective consciousness, such that based on our beliefs, we navigate the collective consciousness field or the collective reality based on our belief programming, such that when we take on the beliefs that engender flow, we actually have a higher amount of luck. And if, if anybody's interested, we actually have studies that people are, there's been professors studying luck and it, it's been found that if you have certain ways of looking at the world, even in a materialist like view of luck where it's like, there's no connection to our consciousness, you actually are still lucky. So even the people that are researching luck are showing that it's intimately related to our state of mind and our consciousness, which in my mind gives like credence to the theory that there's just complex cause effect chains that seem really chaotic. But if we could, if we had a supercomputer powerful enough to track it, that you would actually be able to see paths that are more likely to, to, to make you lucky by society standards. Thank you. Um, oh, go on, Rebecca. Oh, sorry, I was, uh, just as a follow-up. So in that case, um, what do you think, and this is maybe slightly off topic, but it just did immediately begs the question. Um, what do you think the responsibility is of society towards the, the quote unquote unlucky in, in that case? What, what, can you say that again? What is the, the consequence the, of that? The, yeah, or the responsibility of the people who might be traditionally considered quote unquote lucky, what would be their responsibility towards the quote unquote unlucky? Like the larger society? Uh, or, yes, or, or just individuals yeah. that we know or yeah. Okay, it cut off a little bit then, but I think I get the essence of what you're saying. I mean, personally, we think that like, it would be great if society could optimize for ways of being that would support the good of everybody. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, society's perception of the unlucky, um, to me, is more a factor of its own like neuroses and its own, you know, failings that like we don't really have anybody to blame but ourselves for supposed unluckiness you know it's like it's a cultural artifact in my mind and so my the, where that leads me and us and at the institute is like well can we develop can we discover like what the optimal belief structures are to support people being lucky and i see lucky as like a catch all for like you know healthy you know nourished abundant and you know a lot of different things that we we kind of we're, we're trying to sort for it, but I just haven't done a really good job for it at a cultural level. Thank you very much. Uh, can I bounce to Flavius here? Flavius, can you unmute and, and ask your question here? Let's see, did he bounce? No, he didn't. Hello. Sorry. Hi, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, yeah, I was wondering about whether you have made any research into how flow consciousness relates to sacred matrices like the I Ching astrology, because I, I found it's, it's a very powerful way to increase uh, intuition and, and increase especially the relationship between intuition and, and rational comprehension. Uh, it's sometimes I've, I've used the I Ching since I was very small and it's sometimes it's 
mind blowing how uh, I think this model that you're presenting becomes very tangible with with a certain live use of the I Ching or or astrology or other such uh, tools. Yeah. Have you made any research into that? Or do you know about anything? I haven't found much. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. And uh, I personally have found great benefit from those systems such that I became really fascinated by what might actually be going on behind the scenes here because they, they're kind of classically the domain of like divination and what science tends to write off. And so I, um, but I, I, I find that interesting because like, you know, people are experiencing significant benefit from, the, from this. Are they just tricking themselves or is it actually like a real thing? And so I'm actually writing a paper right now that is not so much about the, the, the I Ching in particular, but does have some overlap with astrology and not, not, not really in like the classical sense, but it's basically bringing all the science together that supports the influence of, you know, cosmological forces on human consciousness, which by extension supports a lot of the, the teachings from astrology because, you know, it's commonly thought that the planets have no influence on us essentially, right? Like that's the materialist argument is the planets is, you know, it's too far away, but that actually doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And um, in fact, there's a huge impact of stellar bodies and cosmological forces on human consciousness. And this is studied by astronomers, but because a lot of domains in academia don't talk to each other, they don't realize that there's actually schools of thought where this is not such a crazy idea. And so, um, so basically I'm writing a paper right now that like pairs up all of the research out there to show how this actually operates. It wouldn't bridge so much into the I Ching, except that I could conceptually see like how somebody really tapped into their intuition or a really high state of consciousness might've been able to pull out certain archetypal dynamics, like arch archetypal, like cosmological dynamics and encode it in such a way that it could be a way to reference these different forces without necessarily being exposed to them directly. Like you might be in the magnetic field of the sun, for example. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, I think it's, it's kind of getting into the, the research there and, and I, I think there's a lot of value in it and there's a lot that can be, we can learn from that. And there are actually fields, there's I, in this research, I came across a field called clinical cosmobiology, which studies like the relationships between human health and like fluctuations and, you know, the sun's, uh, you know, electromagnetic field and solar flares and moon cycles and stuff like that. And there's actually a, a significant amount of research showing that there's a super high correlation that's statistically significant. So I think there's, I think it's interesting at the very least. And I think there's some pretty strong writing on the wall for a lot of this stuff. Thank you. Um, one last question I'm seeing, um, Steve Smith, had a question about murmuration and, and group uh, movement in the animal kingdom and, and how that may apply to consciousness. Steve, can you unmute and ask? I'm unmuted. Justin, thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah. You can hear me great. Sorry about the blackout in the video. I'm not trying to be mysterious. I was trying to figure out what's wrong on my end, but it was interrupting the flow. So I stopped doing that. So great, you got the, my question is every, not every, most people have seen this, this, this phenomenon in nature with like giant flocks of swallows exhibiting incredible patterns in the air or fish, a school of fish, they all turn exactly alike, align. And I was intrigued by what you were saying before that uh, a thread, you have a group of people, a thread kind of coalesces. And I'm just wondering, have there been any observations about that nature and phenomenon that applies to humans? I mean, I'll just speak to, to, to my perspective on it and maybe that'll like pull out some like references to different studies. Sometimes they're not always on the tip of my tongue, but they're there in the ethers. Um, so like, if you, it, it, this has been studied neuroscientifically, like, you know, animals have at best, like a much lim more limited conscious mind than us, if they even have a conscious mind. And so it's interesting to me that, for example, in murmuring and flocks of birds or fish and schools of fish or whatever, moving in these incredible levels of sync that are just like, you know, thought to be impossible in humans to some extent, unless we're like really training it because um, it's spontaneous in animals. Um, like to me, that's an example of 
the 65 billion bits of data firing full tilt. Like this is what's possible when we prioritize intuition is that there's this super organism that can form because of the biometric sync between the EEGs, you know, the, the brain waves that we have that you can measure through EEGs, through our heart rate availability, skin conductance, and so on. There's all these biometrics that we use now with like aura rings and stuff to kind of give us data on our mental health and our emotional health and physical health. And like, to me, these are proxies essentially for the coherence field that's possible when we're operating in a deep level of intuitive sync. And so, so in my mind, like when, when birds and fish and so on are doing this, they're just essentially like in a deep level of group flow because they're all radically prioritizing their intuition. And there's this meta consciousness, this super consciousness that forms between them such that they can, they can do this and execute you know, these perfect turns in, in synchronicity. And, and I actually believe that this is part of what's our evolutionary destiny, you know, if we can, if we can get our shit together proverbially and stop fighting, is that this potential exists socially for humans, that we can become more than our individual, you know, selves and, and operate at this level of, of group genius. Like to me, like this is the pinnacle of sense making. If we can all be in such deep sync that we actually are already know what the optimal way of behavior is, but it requires obviously a much more coherent relational field, you know, the, the fish aren't necessarily fighting with each other, competing with each other when this is happening, they're in perfect sync. And that seems to be challenging for humans, but I think it's possible. And I think that, you know, Duncan and I have had conversations about this and we're, we're all interested in studying group flow states. Well, this is possible, you know, like the SWAT team, you know, it's funny to use that because it's maybe a, a, an example that involves conflict perhaps, but nevertheless, like, you know, the New Zealand All Blacks and, and like the SWAT team or the military, like people get into these states where they go into this meta functioning where they don't even need to communicate and they're able to move in perfect synchronicity and stuff. So, so I think that's kind of the domain of what you're talking about and my, my general thinking on it. That's, that's the domain what I'm talking about. My question is, is it that uh, animal sort of uh, 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 meta consciousness is, is the right term that applies in nature with animals that is the same thing for a for a group flow state as well yeah i personally i mean this is you know at the cutting edge of where there's hard research but i personally believe that based on what i've seen and understand that that is the case it's the mechanism we have that capacity but we have like this huge prefrontal cortex that makes us like that it kind of gets in the way of it i think that the the pfc in group coherence could actually amplify the group flow to a level even beyond what animals are capable of but that's like the evolutionary edge for us and something that we're like skilling up into versus necessarily like have the capacity for right now thank you well i think that's a perfect uh jumping off point here um just given the goals of metamodernism of of achieving coherence uh so for more Everybody, you can check out uh, the link to uh, Flow Consciousness Institute. Uh, there's a whole bunch of beautiful free resources on there, as well as a training program uh, for you to begin to examine your belief structures and to begin to see what are the modes of honing focus and, and going beyond focus on the individual uh, to larger structures. Um, thank you so much, Justin. Really appreciate you ha having you on the STOA here. Um, and uh, yeah, just much, much appreciation for your work, brother. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's been a, a pleasure. Thank you everyone for the great dialogue and questions. Thank you, Peter, for creating this. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. I look forward to hearing from you all. Great, so, so check that out. And now, um, Peter, I, I'm just curious, like if there's any interest for like follow-up or, or people staying after and, um, and speaking, what's the protocol there? A little sub chat or, or staying in the, in the field here? Yeah, I can uh, shut this down and then uh, whoever wants to stay um, can just have an open discussion and you can kind of MC it, uh, Duncan. That's cool. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to stay here for another half hour, 45 minutes to um, to keep the ball rolling. Anybody who has to go, uh, feel free. Um, cool. But